On October the 7th this year, a group of Palestinian origin that many states identify as a terrorist organization invaded Israel-Palestine out of sheer frustration of all that has been happening for the Palestinian people since the Balfour Declaration of 1911, the British mandate that ruled the territory up until the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, and the wars of 1967, 1973 and 1982, the settlements, dispossessions, the creation of the enclave in Gaza and the West Bank situation, let alone East Jerusalem. Israel retaliated three weeks later and the events we're seeing played out now on our TV sets flow from a great big violent mess in the history of that region. And where it all leads we may have little detailed idea. Unsurprisingly then, we live in a time when there's a great deal of discussion about the place of ethnic Israel and where that nation stands as the people of God. So how are we to understand all this and what can we learn from this for churches here in, in Wales and indeed all around the world? Let me say right now, though if you are expecting to hear about the politics of the kingdoms of men, you will be deeply disappointed by the next 20 minutes or so. This is a deep dive into the cosmic realities that underlie it all, orbiting around the words of the prophet Malachi at the back of our Old Testament. Malachi 1, 10-14 reads like this, and it's God speaking. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you profane it. You profane it by saying the Lord's table is defiled and its food is contemptible. And you say, what a burden, and you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame and diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Let's break it down, what's happening here in Malachi 1. Well, first of all, God rejects their worthless worship, verse 10. At the very outset of this account, God rejects Israel's worship, worthless worship at that point in their history. All that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. Not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty. I'll accept no offering from your hands. He rejects their worship because it's worthless. He longs that the doors would be closed on the house that he built for his name because it is being used to bring down his name. The very opposite of its purpose. Useless fires on the altar? Just a waste of fuel and effort. <clears throat> the rhetorical language here, and it's, I guess it's kind of poetic. It suggests that as long as the priesthood and people remain disobedient, dishonouring him, the temple doors may as well be closed because God is not going to be at home to receive their worship there. It's worthless worship. But more than that, it's not that he isn't just going to not be there. He wants it shut. He wants it shut. Imagine driving around some of our valley settlements, communities, and seeing chapels shut. And somebody telling you, God wanted that place shut. Can you imagine that? That's shocking, isn't it? But where the temple is concerned here, he wants it shut. The English Standard Version is a pretty little translation, word for word as it were. And it says, oh that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. It's kind of like, just as the Lord didn't look with favour on Cain's offering. Remember Cain and Abel? God didn't look with favour on Cain's offering, so he's turning from theirs. <clears throat> How much do we see in the contemporary Western church of movements without progress? 
activity. No honouring of God. No sense of awe and reverence. Useless fires on the altar. Food for the food bank at Harvest Festival, as we were kind of saying last time. Secular concepts about environmentalism rather than the genesis mandate for creation. Driving our, idea, our ideas about nature and the world around us. And the Harvest Festival again. Projects in place of prayer. Activity in place of awestruck wonder. Feel good factor in, on Sundays in place of fellowship by that one true living God. We're supposed to be there to worship. And way back in Israel's history, there are examples of the folly of doing the wrong thing around the altar, the offerings and particularly putting the right fire on there, the sacrifice and the offering, the, the worship and the dealing with sin of the people. It needed to be richly pure and clean and, and bring honour to God's set-apart name. It wasn't a case of any old thing would do where the worship of God was concerned. And there are examples where the Lord taught his people very clearly this principle. So famously in Leviticus 10, I don't know when you last read through Leviticus, but you might remember this story. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, that's a piece of kit they were using to waft incense about in, in the temple in those days, took his censer and put fire in it, laid, laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them, doing worship the way they wanted to, see? And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. And the Mo then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. <clears throat> and Aaron was speechless. It says, Aaron held his peace. God's name must be honoured and glorified. And where that doesn't happen, he is really not pleased with what pretends to be worship. What is unauthorised fire there in Leviticus? The word used to describe the fire under their offerings is um, zur. And it's a word that comes up 76 times in the Old Testament. Not usually in a worship setting like this. It means to be a stranger or to become estranged. Actually, it's, it's, it's also used of, of, of a prostitute, of a harlot. To be estranged, to be estranged, to be one alienated. Not the right thing, not what God wants. Doing things our way in his church. And way back in 1 Samuel 4, there's a terrible situation in Israel's history where the leaders and people of Israel had got badly out of line, violating God's covenant in various ways, not honouring him in the right way, in the way that he has ordained that it should be. And... And the Israelites were getting hammered in their battles against the Philistines who wanted to take from them the land that God had promised and sent the Israelites to take and hold. So in desperation they put the Ark of Covenant of the Covenant, they took it from the place of worship and they put the Ark of the Covenant at risk in, in, in the battle as if it were a good luck charm. Putting their religious furniture which symbolised the means by which they related to God at risk as if it were some success guaranteeing amulet rather than the symbol of their precious covenant relationship with God, the place where the, the, the sacrifice was offered, the blood was poured out, atonement was made for the people, so that they could have that relationship with God. And the Lord, taking that violation so seriously, he allowed the ark of God to be captured. His name wasn't being honoured the way it should, you see. And godly and ungodly lives were lost, and in the stress of it all, the daughter-in-law of the high priest went into labour, delivered the child alive, then died herself in childbirth. But not before she'd named the child Ichabod, a revealing name for a woman in the last gasps of her life, to think of that. Call that child Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed. They left off their trust and broken their relationship with God, beginning to seek to get him to do what they wanted by manipulation. And God responded by leaving those who'd chosen to rely on their own devices. He said, right, well, I'm going to leave you to your own devices. And it was as if he had picked up his glory and left them. Ichabod, the glory has departed. Now look, we see this principle at work in places once dedicated to God's service closing around us fairly regularly across Wales. When the word of the God who speaks through it and, and fellowships by this means with his people, when that's been let go of, and when the hearts of the people that, that, 
these guys should have been ministering the word to have been let go of as well. God closed the doors of the place that were set apart for his worship in 1 Samuel 4 by removing the central focal point of that worship, the Ark of the Covenant. And the glory of God that was said to dwell above the Ark between the carved cherubim had left them. He would not take fake worship. And here God longs for something equally dramatic to happen in the face of his people's fakery and worship here in Malachi 1. Shutting the doors on his presence above the Ark was drastic as drastic as letting the Philistines capture the ark. But look, there's a much more serious set of consequences to follow than closing the temple doors. Because here in Malachi, it's, it's not just the temple designed for his name being used to bring down his name that the Lord desires to shut down. It's the people designed to honour his name but who are functioning to bring it down that he now intends. After all this time and all this gracious perseverance with them, that he now intends to close down the people. Now, of course, and this is this is a really important thing to grasp. Of course, there is going to be a faithful remnant preserved, but the people as a whole are going to be shut down as the as the covenant people of God, and a new covenant is going to be instituted, as the prophets had foretold from long ago. Their so-called worship is worthless. It doesn't honour his name. It dishonours his name. So God announces his intention to do something immense. But in continuity, not discontinuity, with his ancient purposes. He's going to do a new thing, but it's not a different thing. It's what he has always sought, being defended. And it is what his prophets have prophesied for a long time now. Way back in Israel's history, with the nations significantly driven out and the monarchy united, David sought to set about building the temple at Jerusalem, but was stopped in his tracks by God's word through the prophet Nathan that it was David's son that the Lord wanted to perform that task. And when David heard this, he responded, How great you are, sovereign Lord! There's no one like you, and there's no God but you, as we've heard with our own ears. And who is like your people Israel? The one nation on earth that God went out to redeem as a people for himself and to make a name for himself and to perform great and awesome wonders by driving out nations and their gods from before your people whom you redeemed from Egypt. And you have established your people Israel as your very own forever and you Lord have become their God. <clears throat> There's the thing you see. They knew God's name was to be great in Israel. That, that's what they were about. But here Israel had denigrated God's good name. When they've lost their awe and wonder and fell into formality away from living faith. And they've had warning after warning that this would be the case. They, they, they'd been through the wilderness for doing the like of that. They'd been to Babylon and back for doing the like of that. But now this is going to be the end of the road for them doing the like of that. A new covenant was coming on the same terms to everyone. The temple sacrifice was dramatically going. The sacrifice of the sinless, spotless Lamb of God was coming. And the Spirit was going to be given to reorientate human hearts to God and inspire wonder and worship from the inside out. And this was all coming to all those from amongst the nations that would stand with the remnant of Israel, the faithful remnant, on the level ground at the foot of the cross to bring glory to God. But we're jumping the gun. God rejects their worthless worship. That was the first thing in verse 10. But secondly, God replaces Israel's faulty worship with the worship of the nations. That's verse 11. Malachi 111. My name will be great among the nations, from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place incense and pure offerings will be brought to me, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. No more Ark of the Covenant and atonement there made on the top of the ark between the cherubim. No, no. Atonement made at Calvary's cross by the pouring out of the blood of the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. And my name will be great amongst the nations. If the historic band of clients are not going to do what clients were supposed to do, then God the great patron would drop them off his list and go recruiting amongst the nations. Firstly, the nations. 
In what is clearly a strongly ironic shift of thought, the Lord contrasts the unbelief and virtual paganism in reality of the post-exilic community, he contrasts that with the convert conversion and obedience of the nations that will one day worship the God of Israel. The nations. Who were the nations? The nations had been the people around the ancient Near East who had so outraged and offended God by the time of the Exodus that God had decreed that their land should be allocated to the children of Abraham, the father of the faithful. And over the whole period of the conquest and right up to the creation of the united monarchy under King David, that's what happened. And as they, they grew into the land and they took the land, Israel grew in confidence throughout this process, confidence throughout this process, that they were God's people and this was the land God had given to them. And the thing is, they seem to have pretty effectively forgotten why he did that. To displace the nations that had abandoned God and so on. And as a result of that forgetfulness, the big question started to arise when God declared here in, in Malachi that God was going to change all that. And that in view of the continued unfaithfulness of his historic people Israel, he was ethnic Israel, he was going to broaden the scope of his deliverance and his name, which was not being honoured in ethnic Israel, would now be great amongst the historic enemies of God and of his people. Basically, Malachi says, there was going to be incense everywhere. Incense will be offered pure and so on, worship. Now fascinatingly, in John's vision of the end, in Revelation 8, in the end of the New Testament, we read this. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. And the smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. Worship and prayer going up before the throne of God from amongst the nations. <clears throat> See, by this stage, it appears that the plan revealed in Malachi here has been thoroughly fulfilled. Because the people there in Revelation 8 are described in these terms just before in Revelation 7 as a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, you see, pure worship, and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You see, true worship has been established. Not exclusively amongst the historic Old Covenant people alone. But in this great multitude, no one can count from every nation, including Israel. Tribe, people and language, standing before God's throne in awestruck wonder, giving glory to their God who sits on their throne and to the Lamb who had got them there by grace through faith alone. Patronage and client it restored in the nations washed in the blood of the Lamb. And what had happened was that the gathering of the nations had given rise to their being pure offerings offered everywhere. Malachi says, My name will be great among the nations, from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations says the Lord Almighty and it is their honouring the name of the Lord that makes their offerings pure and it is their honouring of him that makes them acceptable there on that day and God will bring this about for a purpose. Here's the third thing. He's doing it to restore his glory. Verses 11 and 14. You might want to ask the question, how can God doing such a thing bring glory to God, given what he'd already promised to Israel? You've got to go back and read carefully and see what's going on. In Romans 9 to 11, Paul deals with that. He does it you know, with reference to... To the Old, Old Testament history and promises. 
Uh, Paul has already spelled out by this time in Romans 1 to 3 that salvation in Christ, which fulfills the law and the prophets, is for all nations, Jews and Greeks, by grace through faith alone. So Romans 3, 21 to 23 says, Now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. Go back and read more carefully, he says. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all, and this is important, he hasn't just written you off because of your ethnic origin, no, no, no. All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. All have sinned, all fall short, all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. He does that specifically in, the, in, in dealing with, you know, where people have Israeli ethnic origin, uh, Jewish ethnic origin, and Gentile ethnic origin now stand before God. Now, now, now all that he's saying there is an offence to Jewish exceptionalism. So when he's dealing with objections to this gospel that he set out in chapters 1 to 3, in the following chapters, he addresses the questions this raised one by one. And then finally in Romans 9 to 11, he addresses the objection that in this gospel, God has broken his promise to the Jews. People are saying, well, you know, we can't believe his Christian stuff it means God will have broken his promises to the Jews so in Romans 9 8 he, he puts it like this in other words he says <clears throat> it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness and then Paul reminds them, Romans 9, 14 to 16, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. It hadn't been for any other reason that God had entered into covenant with the Jews as the historic people of God, and it was in no way their entitlement. He is perfectly entitled to have mercy on whosoever he pleases, and to withhold it from every judgment-deserving sinner, if he so pleases. His mercy is a grace, not an entitlement, as they seem to have come to think it was. And so they became slack in their faith and in their honouring of him. And then Paul, in that chapter, he cites Hosea and Isaiah to support what he's saying. He's done Moses, and now he does Hosea and Isaiah, covering all the Old Testament bases to, to show the principle that's been forgotten. And what he's saying then, and, and, and then explains with the Old Testament idea, is, is the idea of the faithful remnant from amongst the Old Testament people of God. That God had used historically this remnant amongst the people used to reform and refine their faith, shedding the unfaithful who broke covenant with him, redefining the people of God on the basis of that remnant of faith, the sort of faith that from Abraham onwards defined and delivered the actual people of God. So in Romans 11, 12 to, uh, 2 to 7, Paul writes, God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah? That's going back into, you know, perhaps the major prophets in, in Old Testament times when the people had abandoned God and had gone away and so on. <clears throat> what Scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel, Lord, they've killed your prophets, torn down your altars, I'm the only one left and they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. There is the remnant, you see. And Paul then says, Romans 11, 5, So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, says Paul, but the others were hardened. And then, famously, of course, Paul goes on in that chapter 11 to illustrate this with the parable of breaking unfruitful branches off the olive tree and grafting wild branches onto the existing rootstock, wild olives, the nations, so that they can serve the tree's purpose of bearing fruit for the gardener. That's what was going to happen as the prophets had prophesied. 
That is the principle on which God had operated by preserving his faithful remnant across the history of the Old Testament people of God. He cites 7,000 in Israel in Isaiah's day who had not bowed the knee to Baal. And that is what Paul preached and what had started to happen as the nations were grafted into the tree of the faithful remnant from the day of Pentecost onwards. So, back in Malachi 1, God spelled out where history was heading. A history of which we read in the New Testament, of which most of us as Gentile believers are now privileged to be part of. Malachi 1.11 My name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. And then verses 12 to 13 back in Malachi, they go on to contrast radically the behaviour of Israel and, and the honour the nations will give their new covenanted patron. Worship. Incense rising, pure worship. And the verdict of God the great king at the conclusion of this matter is this. Verse 14. Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. It doesn't stop there. The reason is given. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared, honoured, revered among the nations. Okay. Big stuff. Conclusion. Here's how all that Malachi prophesies here works out. For 400 years after Malachi, the people will continue to fail in that 400-year profitless silence from their divine patron. They will fail in that period to give him true allegiance, and they will live beneath heavens as hard as, as a bronze dome. And that's what it's like to live with an outward form of faith, but no real relationship with the living God. And under that dome they will stay. Until the Son of Righteousness does arise, with healing in his wings. And the nations will see the light in his coming and join with the faithful remnant of the historic Jewish people of God in faithful allegiance to Christ the new Messiah King. A new people, a new way, a kingdom not of this world, a new covenant for the new covenant people of God. One new people, one new way, one new faithful, grace-saved and faith-driven people for the covenant-keeping God. The glory that had departed now restored in the redemption he has provided by grace being reflected in the heartfelt worship of the one new people of God, redeemed from every nation. Why? Because he will. Because he must have the glory that is due to his name. 